Hello, I'm Ron Ballou. I'd like to welcome you to the program that we have today. We're going to be calling it Computer Engine Data Interpretation. I don't have a fancy PowerPoint with a bunch of charts to go over with you. What I do have is the latest and greatest Altel scan tool connected to a 2020 Chevrolet Malibu. This Malibu is equipped with a 1.5 liter engine. It's turbocharged. It has variable cam timing and gasoline direct injection. So we're going to have the latest and greatest in data PIDs to go over. The data interpretation class, we want to make sure that you're not utilizing your scan tool as a giant trouble code reader. We want you to be more familiar and more accurate in going over the data PIDs and understanding how the computer utilizes them and how you can interpret the data to help you diagnose the vehicle, get it fixed, and put more money in your pocket. We're going to start off with just going to the top of the engine data. The first one here is hood position. That's probably not real important except for this vehicle does have active grill shutters. The computer can control the ambient air to the charge air cooler and the turbocharging system. So as an input to the computer, it needs to know if the hood is open or closed to understand how it's going to control the active hood or the active uh, grill shutters. The next one more important is engine speed. Yes, engine speed is basically the rotational amount of RPM from our crankshaft sensor. One thing I want to mention here when we're looking at data is always in the back of your mind there's one big question going on all the time. And that big question is, do you believe it? Do you believe that RPM is accurate? Do you believe that temperature is accurate? Do you believe that throttle angle is accurate? Do you believe that airflow rate or that manifold pressure is accurate? Because it has to be accurate information for the computer to do its job. So as you scan over this data, if you see something that doesn't look normal, like the engine hasn't been running very long and it's already at 250 degrees, there's either a problem in the cooling system or there's a problem in the, in the data coming through as far as the coolant temp sensor. But you always are asking the question, do you believe what you're looking at to be accurate and true? If it's not, you better investigate why. So another thing on engine speed, the vehicle, or I should say the computer's vehicle, it utilizes this information to determine when to fire the injectors in some applications and when to fire the spark. So if a vehicle came into the shop, towed in, no spark, no injector pulse, no start, you'd probably want to pay particular attention during cranking, do you have an RPM signal? Our Malibu is running right now. You can see the engine speed is hovering right around 670, 680 RPM, and I believe it. Now, at any time, if we were revving the engine or cruising down the road and the RPM got real erratic, like jumped up to 6,000 RPM or went down to zero, that's going to lead me into more than likely doing some further pinpoint testing of the crankshaft sensor because I don't believe the information coming through that the engine actually changed that much. But keep in mind, it is the trigger for the injectors and the spark. So without a trigger, we're walking. We're, we're in a walk home mode. Moving forward, the next PID we have is a coolant temp sensor. Coolant temp sensor, the computer has to know the temperature of the engine. One, it has to know the temperature of the engine to know how much fuel deliver, to deliver. A cold engine always requires more fuel. So in the background, in the programming, we're going to find that there's going to be a multiplier or a scalar that as the base fuel map is going to change depending upon engine temperature. The colder the engine, the more fuel it's going to need. 
We also use engine temperature to determine closed loop operation. In fact, it's one of the key components that allows us to go into closed loop. There's three things that allow us to go into closed loop. One is engine temperature directly coming from the coolant temp sensor. The other one is time. And when I mean time, the computer looks at how much time the engine has been running since startup. And third is the oxygen sensor. Is the oxygen sensor hot enough to go to work? Now an oxygen sensor cannot produce a half a volt unless it's approximately 700 degrees. So the computer is going to watch the coolant temperature to come up. It's going to be programmed in the background at what temperature is this engine allowed to go closed loop. Second, has the engine been running long enough to go closed loop? How long does it take? Well, that time and temperature correlation is dependent upon engine temperature. When we started this engine, it was around 42 degrees Celsius. At that time, 40 de 42 degrees Celsius was the startup coolant temperature. That's going to set the clock timer. For example, maybe at 42 Celsius, the clock timer is two minutes. But at now, we're at 84 degrees Celsius. If we shut it off and restart it, the clock timer may be 10, 15 seconds. The clock timer changes based upon startup coolant temperature. Now, we don't have that pit up here in front of us right now, but trust me, it's in there. So, startup coolant temperature, coolant temperature, how long has the engine been running, and can the oxygen sensor produce a half a volt? Once we've met those three enabling criteria, we'll go into closed loop. And what is closed loop? Closed loop, we're going to be looking at shortly the oxygen sensor. The computer's going to utilize the oxygen sensor voltage to determine whether or not the fuel mixture is richer than stoichiometric, richer or leaner than perfect, and we'll adjust the fuel so that we float over that perfect or stoichiometric air fuel mixture. Moving on. Notice up here we have IAT sensor 1 and IAT sensor 2. Further on in our data PIDs, we'll find that we have an IAT sensor 3. This vehicle has three intake air temperature sensors. Number one intake air temperature sensor will either be part of the mass airflow sensor or a separate sensor in the air filter housing. So now the computer knows the outside ambient air temp. Then there's going to be an air temp sensor after the charge air cooler. So right away the computer knows the temperature of the air outside. It knows that the turbocharger has pressurized that air, which is going to increase the temperature. Now how well did our charge air cooler bring that temperature back down? The turbocharger will increase the pressure, which increases the temperature. The charge air cooler will bring the temperature back down. Third, where is the third IAT? It's part of the MAP sensor in the intake manifold. So now we know ambient air temperature. We know the temperature directly of the air charge as it comes out of the charge air cooler. And we know the temperature in the intake manifold. So the computer has very reliable information about what the air temperature is anywhere on this engine because the computer is going to control boost pressure, which is going to increase the air temperature, but it's also going to have feedback on how well the charge air cooler is cooling that pressurized hot air. We want to cool it back down so it's more dense. The more dense the air, the more oxygen rich it is, the more power we can make. So, IAT sensor 1 is probably after the charge air cooler. IAT sensor 2 is probably in the intake manifold. And the ambient air temperature is in the air cleaner housing, or in this case of our 8-wire mass airflow sensor, 
it's going to be a part of the mass airflow sensor. 